Hello, everybody. This is Nina Olson. I'm the executive director for the Center for Taxpayer Rights, and this is the seventh um, in our tax chat series on transforming tax administration. And this is the second tax chat we've had on the topic of artificial intelligence, big data, um, and the use of basically automation in tax administration. And we have a great group of experts today to talk us through. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in their introductions. Um, we have Terry Coglianese from University of Pennsylvania. Um, we have Josh Blank from um, University. Now, Josh, I've just lost. You are from University of California, Irvine. Sorry about that. We have Leo Sofsky from University of North Carolina School of Law. And we have Toon Calders, who is from the DigiTax Center at the University of Antwerp. Um, so we're really excited about this particular discussion. We're going to start with a discussion about the use and the issues relating to artificial intelligence in, the fe in federal government and also federal government oversight of artificial intelligence. And then Josh and Lee are going to talk about specific issues dealing with automated legal guidance um, and some of the, the, the the privacy and tax and rights and discrimination issues that might arise in that and just legal accuracy. And then we'll turn to Tune to talk about some of the work that he's been doing on basically the training data sets and how to ferret out bias in some of the training sets and algorithms um, as you're using artificial intelligence going forward and really anything else that anybody feels like talking about. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Carrie, um, who's going to share some slides while he walks us through giving us a general framework for the use of artificial intelligence in federal government or the regulation thereof. Thank you very much, uh, Nina. It's a privilege to be here and uh, appreciate all that you're doing to spotlight these important issues for uh, government, and in particular, obviously, for uh, the parts of government dealing with uh, revenue administration. I'm going to talk more broadly at the outset to, as Nina said, set the framework. And I'm going to give a, a very um, uh, uh, extensive but quick sort of survey of where things are with um, uh, AI and the federal government today. This is something that um, I'm going to focus on the federal governments, uh, the state and local governments are also looking at this. There's, uh, there's state legislation creating task forces and calling for studies. And we have some cities that have adopted ordinances related to facial recognition or use of AI in employment. But the focus here will be on uh, the federal government in the United States, recognizing that there are, are, are uh, also developments happening around the world too. Overarching uh, message here is that the US is still early in both its governmental use of AI and its policy development with respect to the use of AI in the outset. There's no comprehensive uh, legislation on AI. Uh, there are some government-wide frameworks, but they're not binding at all. Um, uh, what we do see are attention to some specific applications of AI. Uh, such as in transportation, medical devices, and so forth. And I'll highlight some of those. But most of these actions are non-binding in the form of guidance, even though there's just a few binding requirements. Um, I'm going to highlight two major sort of questions or implications for administrative law and regulatory practice that I think are important to keep in mind in any discussion about AI and its use in government. One is the issue about governmental oversight of the private sector's use of AI, questions about uh, who should be overseeing it, what kind of institution, uh, what type of regulatory standards should be used, guidance versus binding standards, what type of regulatory instrument choice. But the second question is about the governmental use of AI itself in, in, in administration, such as tax administration, which we'll be focusing on a lot today. Uh, there's administrative law issues surrounding that governmental use, such as uh, 
uh, whether AI can substitute for human decision making in rulemaking and adjudicating. Uh, and there's also uh, questions now with uh, the uh, large language models that we've all been seeing uh, introduced uh, in, in getting a lot of attention uh, over the last several months about what kind of implications that might have for the commenting process in rulemaking, if it will be easy for there to be uh, very thought, very uh, in-depth uh, now uh, uh, computer-generated comments. Uh, and lastly, I think there's also uh, important questions about what should be the standards for government when it uses it. Uh, uses AI responsibly. And I hope this uh, presentation is, oh, I'll go through this quickly, can at least um, give us a, a, a general overview of these two kinds of issues and a framework for further discussion in the tax context. Let me just say that uh, there is a, a, a lot of legislation uh, that's being proposed and considered. Uh, Chuck Schumer has uh, announced that he's going to be moving forward and putting forward some uh, legislation at the federal level. So things are, are changing fast. And most recently, the White House has put a, a spotlight on AI as well and released an AI strategy. Um, so uh, what, whatever I can share today in our discussion today uh, is really only a snapshot of, of what is ultimately a moving picture. Uh, the focus, of course, on AI by government is not in, in, entirely new. There is some legislation on the books already uh, that Congress has adopted. Largely, they're oriented towards research and development. Uh, and uh, the past Congress had over 300 bills dealing with AI that had been introduced. And there's quite a number of administrative actions that have been taking place over the last approximately five years. There were executive orders in the Trump administration. There's some frameworks that have been released for responsible use of AI by governments, as well as the private sector, by ACUS, uh, GAO, and NIST and there's assorted agency actions. And what I hope to do is give you a flavor for this kind of action. I'm gonna start with just some general policies at the federal level on AI. Uh, the AI and Government Act that was uh, adopted at the end of 2020 established an AI center of excellence within the GSA and called upon the OMB to develop a, a set of recommended approaches for, for uh, agencies uh, to follow when using AI to protect civil rights and, and, and uh, uh, identify and, and mitigate for any discriminatory biases. The Trump administration had uh, a couple of executive orders, uh, one that was about uh, promoting AI uh, throughout the, the, the country and, and helping the, the U.S. become a, a leader in this, but also it recognized the need for protecting civil liberties and privacy. Uh, and then uh, the Trump administration also issued a guidance of, uh, from OMB on uh, the use of AI. And uh, this guidance, on the one hand, said we really ought to, as a nation, avoid impeding innovation in this area. Interesting how the conversation today is a lot about thinking about uh, what the right regulatory approaches should be. But it did also recognize that there are risks uh, associated with AI. The Administrative Conference in 2020 adopted a statement on agency use of artificial intelligence. It followed on a report that uh, a team of researchers from Stanford and NYU prepared and, and a separate report that I prepared. It uh, recognized that AI, even in 2020, was already starting to be transforming certain kinds of governmental operations. And it identified a series of issues and, and that, that agencies should look at when they are um, using uh, AI, including th issues such as transparency and bias, which I think we'll talk about more. Uh, another Trump executive order, the, this, these orders are still in effect. It articulated nine principles for agencies to follow uh, when uh, they are using AI. And you can see that these include, again, uh, protection of, of, of values, uh, safety, uh, responsibility, transparency, uh, and, and reliability. 
there is a, a National AI Initiative Act uh, that uh, it was contained in the NDAA of 2021. It established a White House National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Office that has among its goals uh, promoting trustworthy AI uses and a directedness to develop a voluntary risk management framework for trustworthy AI. Uh, the next in sort of a chronological order was the development of an accountability framework that the US GAO uh, adopted in June of 2021. And then uh, the next month, NIST launched a process to develop its own uh, risk management framework around AI use, both in the public sector as well as in the uh, the private sector, and then it issued its final risk management framework in January of this year. That framework, as I said, applies to both public and private use and provides a, a, a kind of um, uh, almost Deming circle type process for uh, systems developers and users to follow to make sure that uh, AI doesn't create uh, unanticipated problems uh, and certainly that it doesn't um, uh, create inequitable outcomes either. Uh, the administration, the White House in October of 2021 uh, published a, a, a piece in Wired Magazine authored by officials in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy that called for uh, a Bill of Rights uh, for Americans uh, in an AI era. And in October 2022, uh, that office actually released a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, articulating a set of principles for um, the use of AI and to protect uh, the public from potential harms while also reaping the, the benefits of AI. This blueprint calls for uh, safe and effective si systems, uh, protection from discrimination, uh, protection for privacy, transparency, uh, and uh, some choice uh, by users. Uh, we're expecting, uh, according to a, a, a statement uh, not attributed to anybody, but it, but it uh, was uh, in a call out uh, on the White House website that OMB will in the coming months be issuing another set of guidance uh, for government agencies. So again, stay tuned. At the same time, these general policies have been put in place across the entire federal government. There's been a range of agency specific actions. And let me just highlight some of these. Uh, the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in the Department of Transportation in 2017, now going back, uh, almost six years, uh, adopted a voluntary guidance for AI in autonomous vehicle uh, systems. Uh, it is put in place a, a, a voluntary approach uh, to uh, reporting of testing uh, 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 for safety and of these autonomous vehicle technologies. And, there, and it has issued, and this is binding, a general order that requires uh, vehicle manufacturers to report to the federal government any crashes that are occurring with AI-based driving systems. So this is one of the few really uh, binding uh, aspects of regulation of AI that we do have in place today. The FDA is the other area where we have some binding um, uh, standards uh, when it comes to AI in uh, medical devices. Uh, these are covered under existing FDA medical device regulations and the uh, number of, of instances in which uh, the FDA is considering uh, devices that deploy AI technology is growing, as this chart indicates. Uh, for example, uh, in February of 21, uh, 2020, excuse me, um, the FDA authorized marketing of a cardiac ultrasound software that could use AI to uh, help guide users. And they uh, approved this under uh, existing uh, practices uh, and, and procedures for approving medical devices. Uh, the uh, FDA, though, has in January 21 uh, adopted a, a medical device uh, action plan for AI-based uh, software. So they're, they're attending to this uh, as well. 
We also have uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, adopting uh, uh, some guidance and a final rule to, to uh, address uh, AI-based medical treatment. So how can, uh, when the F is one thing for the FDA to approve these technologies, then the next question is, will uh, Medicare reimburse for them? And Medicare has been working on that. Uh, there's uh, an HHS proposed rule on uh, addressing algorithmic discrimination when uh, AI is being used in the medical and healthcare field. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, has issued a general policy statement on uh, the use of AI in lending uh, decision making. It uh, is also uh, likely to be uh, proposing a rule on AI in housing valuations and mortgage markets as well. Uh, the Department of Education is monitoring AI use in the educational setting. No definite policy yet, but they have a website that they're uh, indicating that they're working on it. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission is considering a rulemaking on algorithmic decision making uh, and discrimination. So look for some action perhaps down the road with the FTC. Uh, the U.S. Department of Justice has issued guidance about AI and disability discrimination in the employment context in a joint project with the EEOC. Uh, the Department of Labor is attentive to this and has at least uh, articulated uh, some uh, attention to it in a in, in, in a blog on its website. The Department of Energy is developing a risk management framework for uh, AI use in energy systems. It's expressly not a binding document. Uh, the US Copyright Office has uh, uh, issued some guidance on human authorship uh, and, and, and the implications that AI, and certainly with respect to some of these large language models and, 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 and um, and some of the uh, other kinds of generative AI systems with respect to images, there are copyright issues and the Copyright Office is working on that. So let me come back to this, this, this two-part uh, question about AI, both how government should oversee uh, this in the private sector and how government uh, itself should use it. Let me focus first on the private sector use. There's a question of what institutions should regulate AI. Uh, there's a lot of attention in Washington, D.C. these days to creating a dedicated agency to regulate AI. Sam Altman of OpenAI was suggesting that industry would favor this, maybe for obvious reasons. I've argued recently uh, that I think this would be a mistake. Uh, so much of AI it, and its implications for safety, bias, and the like it, it depends upon the applications in which it's used and the domain specific knowledge that existing agencies bring is going to be important for uh, overseeing that. It's not to say that there couldn't be a benefit from centralized uh, resources, but, but the existing regulators need to know, uh, as I think this survey of what agencies are already doing kind of shows. There's questions about how to regulate AI, and this draws uh, also from that same paper of mine We've got to have a, a system of agile regulation and think about flexible regulatory instruments. Uh, mandatory disclosure is, I think, going to be an important component for regulating AI use. But I, I think there's also a role for what I've called management-based regulation, requiring firms to engage in their own internal auditing. But there's no substitute ultimately for vigilance either. Uh, regulators have to be paying attention. This is a fast moving area. And th that's why we need the capacity in existing regulatory institutions to be able to monitor changes. AI in, in terms of its use in the public sector, uh, it is coming into play. This uh, chart from 2020 already showed that there were more than 100 different use cases in the federal government. Uh, a lot of it at that point in time was in the in, in background analysis and research, but it has been used in enforcement and service delivery, and we're going to see that just grow over time. Ultimately, uh, from the standpoint of administrative law, I've written uh, a, uh, to, to suggest in a number of articles that 
administrative law can accommodate the use of AI by government. In some sense, it might even be said that it is uh, sort of the culmination of, uh, of administrative law principles to replace humans with uh, automated systems even. Uh, when it comes to regulating by robot and adjudicating by algorithm, there's a range of administrative law questions. Would this become a, an unlawful private delegation? Nah, I don't think not. It would um, because um, uh, these algorithms are uh, not bringing their own biases like a private actor could. Is it a denial of due process? Probably not again to, to rely on AI systems uh, because uh, AI will likely fare better than the status quo if it's used responsibly uh, on key aspects of our due process balancing test under Matthews v. Eldridge. And what about the black box nature? Would that be a barrier to governmental use of AI? Probably not, because um, uh, as long as agencies are able to explain, disclose that they're using algorithms and, and explain how they've been designed and tested, uh, that probably withstands, at least under current notions of administrative law, uh, what is needed. There are questions about agencies' responsibilities for uh, responding to public comments and whether uh, comments generated by AI should be treated differently. Look for that being an issue for, for federal agencies. Let me just end by uh, saying that, um, uh, as I said earlier, AI is uh, being used in a wide range of different applications. Uh, that means it's gonna be embedded in government too in many different ways, including in tax administration. What we need to do in the months and, and will need to do in the years ahead is make sure that these systems that are being deployed by government agencies, as well as the private sector, are being uh, responsibly developed adequately val validated and tested and properly audited so that we can minimize the downsides from AI systems while also taking advantage of all the many, what I think are possible uh, benefits that can come from them. So thank you and I look forward to the discussion. That was such a great um, introduction to this topic, comprehensive introduction. And I think for those of us that aren't really, you know, watching this area minutely, that to see the breadth of how AI has already been introduced and the efforts by different agencies to deal with it is really helpful. Um, and I personally didn't know that there was a Bill of Rights introduced, which is also very helpful. I think, you know, before we go to Lee and Josh and others may want to talk about this, one of the things that we had discussed when we were planning this program was just the issue of procurement and, you know, that as agencies are obtaining these systems and they may not be building it themselves, but they will be using contractors that you get into issues of um you know, proprietary information in what you've called a double black box, because you not only don't know what's in the information, but you just can't get, you know, you can't get in and do that explanation that is necessary to avoid arbitrary and capricious. you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I know you're exactly right. I mean, this is an important area if, when government is using AI. Often, you know, agencies don't have enough capacity on their own to develop this. And, and we know that in general, agencies rely on contractors for many, many uh, support aspects of, of administration. Uh, and that's going to be true also for uh, the development and deployment of AI systems. The double black box problem that you mentioned comes about because there's a first layer of sort of intrinsic black box nature to machine learning algorithms. The way they are autonomous means it, it, it's often hard to explain intuitively uh, why they generate the results they do. And this is often why they're called black box algorithms. But the double layer comes into play when uh, someone relies on a contractor to develop these systems and the contractor then claims trade secret protection and is not willing to, to disclose anything about what these algorithms do. I don't think that the, the first layer is a barrier 
uh, under administrative law. I think there's, there's again, there, as long as agencies are able to explain what the objectives are for the algorithm, how they've been specified, um, uh, you know, what the data are that they're being used. There's, there's actually in the private sector, a, a more systematic form of disclosure that's coming about called model cards or system cards that they, they, they can provide explanations for how these algorithms are working. But if agencies aren't thoughtful up front when they're engaging private contractors and procuring services for AI development, uh, they may be unable to get that kind of explanatory information that would be needed and, and appropriate to be disclosed to the public. So uh, it's in some sense a very easy fix if procurement officers are attentive to this and make sure that contracts um, uh, do uh, uh, you know, authorize uh, the, the federal government to request and obtain from the contractors necessary information. Let me just say that there's also another set of provisions that, that the government ought to be thinking about when procuring AI services, and that's provisions related to responsible AI use. Mm -hmm. uh, I've written a paper recently that suggests that procurement would be a very important vehicle for AI governance. And there's no reason that government contracts for AI services could not embed in the language of those contracts uh, provisions that require the contractor to follow essentially a bill of rights uh, or other kinds of principles of responsible AI. So I think both things are important going forward when governments are uh, you know, engaging private contractors on it with AI services, both uh, making sure you have provisions to allow adequate transparency and, and also thinking about provisions that can promote responsible AI use. Yeah, that's just, I think the, the procurement issue is just as someone who worked with procurement offices in the IRS, I'm just so really conscious of the limitations of the skills currently and what needs to step up. Before we turn to Josh and Lee, because this kind of leads to some of what you're doing, um, and I'm going to, we need to mute everybody, please. Um, I wanted to note a comment and anybody can put any questions or comments in the chat, please. But Justin Schwigel, who is from a low-income taxpayer clinic and has done a fair amount of work using the Freedom of Information Act to get information from the IRS about how they handle automated correspondence examinations, which constitutes about 80% of the individual audits that are conducted every year. And this is where it's just spewed out by a machine. And I don't think you can say it's artificial intelligence because often there's no intelligence involved in there. That is a personal opinion. Um, but I think, you know, Justin has been getting some responses back about, you know, we're not going to disclose information through, you know, as under the enforcement exception to FOIA. And I personally am very worried that some of these algorithms that are used in the enforcement agencies um, that really have legal impact on people and, inc and incredible impact on people's property and lives um, will not be subject to disclosure, um, particularly, and, and they are actually the ones that we really need you know, disclose so that we can make sure that they are not discriminating or based on faulty data sets, historically, you know, imperfect data sets, et cetera. So with that observation, I'm just going to, unless somebody wants to address that, I'm just going to turn this over to Josh and Lee, and you can decide who you want to go first, and we can talk. Great. Well, thanks very much, Nina. Uh, for the invitation to be here in the Center for Taxpayer Rights. And thank you, Carrie, for the, the great introduction and, and, and overview of this topic. Uh, I'm Josh Blank, and my co-presenter is Leo Sofsky. And our current paper that we've just published in Minnesota Law Review is called Automated Agencies. It's part of a much longer and ongoing line of work. And I thought uh, maybe just to get started, I could situate our paper in our broader line of work to describe where our research has been and where it's going, and then 
uh, we can talk specifically uh, about uh, some of the new tools and mechanisms that the IRS is using to deliver guidance in an automated manner to the public. Our research, I guess Lee and I have been working together now almost six or seven years on this topic. It started back in 2017 when we wrote a paper called Simplexity, Plain Language and the Tax Law. And we've published a series of papers since then on the government's use of plain language to explain complex law. Sometimes it's the printed publications, the type we used to get from the library for tax returns, uh, or automated systems that I can describe in just a couple of minutes. And in 2021, we were selected by the Administrative Conference of the United States, ACUS, to study the use of automated legal guidance across all of the federal agencies. And so the research that we'll present today really grows out of that, that study. Uh, we are currently working on a book called Automated Agencies, The Transformation of Government Guidance, which will be published by Cambridge University Press, uh, hopefully in 2025. Uh, but uh, we're eager for feedback because we're still working on this topic as part of our larger project. I guess I'll start just by describing a concept that we've found is just a common theme throughout all of these automated tools we're seeing across the government. We, we describe it as simplexity. Simplexity is, is what we've described as a form of communication where the government, such as the IRS, tries to explain the law to the public. Uh, and the law is complex, but the government does not actually simplify the law. Instead, it presents the law as though it's simple. And we've illustrated in our work how the government's simple presentation of complex law can result in deviations from the underlying law, where the government presents the formal law as something other than what it actually is. So having identified simplexity in this way, and we've spent a lot of time exploring it in the tax context, we worked with ACUS throughout 2021 and 2022 to study agency use of automated legal guidance across the federal government. What is automated legal guidance? A few examples, the Interactive Tax Assistant is an online tool created by the IRS that answers tax questions specific to taxpayers' personal circumstances. Are you entitled to certain medical expense deductions? Are scholarship awards required to be included in income? Uh, can I uh, uh, claim the earned income tax credit? And many other questions. Emma is another example. Emma is a virtual assistant created by the US Citizenship and Immigration Services that answers questions that users have about US immigration. For example, uh, can a green card holder travel outside the US to visit an ailing relative without having an adverse effect on immigration status? Aiden is a virtual assistant created by the US Department of Education. The name Aiden comes from uh, federal student aid, Aiden Aid. And this tool helps members of the public receive answers to questions about federal student aid, such as whether a student loan is dischargeable in bankruptcy. These are just a few examples of a much broader development through chatbots, virtual assistants, and other tools. Agencies are increasingly relying on artificial intelligence to help the public understand and apply the law. Uh, maybe just for a couple of minutes, we could give you some examples of how the IRS tool works, the Interactive Tax Assistant, uh, ITA. And I'll maybe share the screen just for a minute to give you an example or two, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Lee to talk a little bit more about our study. Hopefully the technology here will work. Okay, so what you should be seeing on the screen right now is an image uh, that I just took a screenshot of from the Interactive Tax Assistant. And this tool sometimes delivers answers that are consistent with the tax law and clearly correct. So if it's an unambiguous issue where there is a relatively straightforward answer, the Interactive Tax Assistant can deliver accurate responses quickly and efficiently. Take, for example, filing deadlines. Imagine that there is a computer programmer who moves to the US from another country and uh, is a lawful permanent resident, a green card holder. And after being in the US for a year, 
uh, wants to find out when is my tax return due. So let's imagine the year is 2022 and wants to know uh, when is my tax return due. So this taxpayer can visit the Interactive Tax Assistant and click on a category titled, what is the due date of my federal tax return or am I eligible to request an extension? And the Interactive Tax Assistant then proceeds to ask a number of questions to the individual. Uh, for example, the Interactive Tax Assistant asks, uh, will you be living outside the US and Puerto Rico on April 18th, 2023? Uh, and he checks his schedule and says, no, clicks no. Um, in that case, the Interactive Tax Assistant will instantly inform the computer programmer that his tax return is considered to be timely if it's filed by April 18th, 2023. This is a simple example that shows how a tool like the Interactive Tax Assistant can help a taxpayer determine the answer to a simple tax compliance question quickly and accurately. Uh, this also is not necessarily an intuitive answer. A lot of people think April 15th is the deadline. As tax people, we know that sometimes a different date can be considered timely for different reasons. And uh, 2023 was one of these years. And as you can also see from the tool, it can handle different scenarios. If the answer to the question about living outside of the US was different, the answer would have been different. Uh, but the key is that the answer here is consistent with the formal tax law. However, this tool can also deliver answers that deviate from the underlying tax law. So just to give uh, a different example, and it's a lot more complicated, but just to describe a different example, imagine a chronically ill taxpayer who is not able to take care of daily needs, things like bathing, cooking meals, basic house cleaning, administering daily medication. And so the taxpayer hires a home health aide who assists with all of these needs. And the taxpayer wants to figure out, am I entitled to any type of deduction for this home health aide? So to determine whether the expense of hiring the home health aide is tax deductible, the taxpayer turns to the interactive tax assistant and clicks on the category titled, can I deduct my medical and dental expenses? And again, the interactive tax assistant is going to ask a series of questions. Uh, one of the questions will be about the type of expense. And so the taxpayer will click household help expenses. And as soon as the taxpayer clicks household help expenses, the interactive tax assistant gives an answer and the answer is very clear in bold letters under the, the words answers, the household help expenses are not a deductible expense. And that's it, no ambiguity. It's not a qualified medical expense. This answer, however, may be inconsistent with the governing law. After 1996, the Internal Revenue Code contains provisions regarding qualified long-term care services. And those have now been added to the list of deductible medical care expenses in section 213. Qualified long-term care services is defined as including among other things, maintenance or personal care services. And the legislative history to this statute makes it clear that maintenance or personal care services can include meal preparation, household cleaning, and other similar services which the chronically ill are, are unable to perform. So this example hopefully illustrates that there's a taxpayer, in, in this case, a chronically ill taxpayer, who has access to a very helpful automated tool, the Interactive Tax Assistant. And that tool said very clearly, your expenses are not deductible, even though this taxpayer may have been eligible to claim them. This example illustrates how in the uh, attempt to present the law in a straightforward manner, an agency has delivered an explanation of the law that deviates actually in a pretty material way from the underlying law. So I'll just stop sharing the screen to talk for a few more minutes about our general study. Our goal uh, in our study, as a result of lots of examples like the one I just showed, was to understand how current federal agencies are using automated legal guidance and, and to make recommendations to these agencies through ACUS. So what we did was canvas the use of automated legal guidance across all of the agencies. We did an in-depth study 
and legal analysis of each of the principal models of automated legal guidance that we found from our canvassing. We rounded out our research with interviews of agency officials who had direct or supervisory responsibility over the most well-developed automated legal guidance tools, namely Emma at USCIS, the Interactive Tax Assistant at the IRS, and Aiden, uh, Federal Student Aid. Uh, we also spoke to the Government Services Administration officials who help support agencies and efforts to develop automated legal guidance tools. Our primary findings, we found widespread use of automation by federal agencies in communications with the public, but it varied in terms of levels of sophistication. Uh, from the low level, for example, the Department of Agriculture has a tool called Ask USDA, which is a pretty unsophisticated tool. Uh, it, it, it provides uh, links to different websites and, and, and general information to a much higher level of sophistication. The Department of Education's Aiden uses natural language processing. Also, these tools varied in terms of legal content. For example, Ask USDA discusses and cites regulations regarding imports and exports. We also, Lee and I found that it has interesting and helpful non-legal content. For example, you can learn how long you should keep your salad dressing uh, in the refrigerator before it's too long. Uh, we also found extensive use of these tools by the public. For example, Emma responds to over 35 million inquiries from users. The interactive tax assistant typically uh, receives about two and a half million visits, but we learned during our interviews during the height of the pandemic, uh, the interactive tax assistant received uh, over 5 million visits. And so, uh, especially when people weren't available to answer any calls, uh, the interactive tax assistant became a very important tool. Uh, we've also found plans by other agencies to introduce or expand the use of these tools uh, in the future. Through our own research regarding automated legal guidance tools, we found uses of complexity by these tools as we had expected, but it was significantly greater in the context of automated legal guidance than things like printed publications. And the reason we found this complexity to be exacerbated, uh, and this was confirmed by the federal agency officials we interviewed, is that automated legal tool, guidance tools have been designed so that they deliver super concise answers. That's actually a phrase we heard again and again. It needs to be super concise, much more so than in a written publication. A lot of people are getting these answers on their phone. And we also heard that users are unable to read anything more than the briefest explanations in that context. Uh, and so as a result, this made deviations from the underlying law more likely uh, and at times more significant. At the same time, we found little to no substantive evaluation by agencies of automated legal guidance of the type of analysis that, that we did. Uh, for instance, in order to evaluate these tools, we heard again and again that agencies looked at how often the tools would say, I don't know. The phrase they would use for this was the I don't know rate. And that was simply a reference to the number of times a tool could not give an answer to the user's inquiry. And if the I don't know rate was low, the agencies deemed these tools to be very effective. We found low levels of engagement by higher level agency officials in the construction of automated legal guidance tools. And we also found a lack of disclosure. Uh, the guidance tools tended not to disclose that the agencies were not bound to the guidance being offered and that users could not rely on the guidance for protection against penalties should the agency challenge the position that users took after relying on the guidance. Other Problematic practices that we observed included the failure to archive information provided by the guidance tools. One story that we can tell from personal experience is we started our research and then a year later tried to go back and look at some of the issues that we had started with and we found that the language had been changed, but we couldn't find an archive. And we used other tools to try to find those old web pages, but the, the archive we did not find. It, it is not on the agency website. Uh, for members of the public who might need to go back and look at what they read maybe maybe during the first months of the pandemic when they were trying to figure out how to handle 
the tax treatment of economic impact payments and things like that, there's no archive that they can access easily. Uh, we also found that users were not able to uh, obtain a record of their conversation with the tools. Uh, in other words, a report of the inputs and the outputs from the user and the tools. And so that is a, an overview of our study. Uh, an important part of our study is that we spent a lot of time talking with the agency officials who are on the ground uh, designing and evaluating these tools. And so uh, to describe the interviews that we did and, and also our overall recommendations, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Lee. Thanks, Josh. Yes, so building off of Josh's description of our general findings based on some of our own research, I just wanted to mention a few highlights of some of the perspective that we were able to get from agency officials who work with automated legal guidance and design it uh, from interviews with them. Uh, so uh, agency officials who design automated legal guidance generally believed that users did not or could not rely on such guidance, even though millions of users are in fact using such guidance per year per agency guidance tool. Uh, we repeatedly heard from agency officials working in this area that they did not believe that automated legal guidance could be wrong. And this belief was based on the fact that the automated legal guidance was providing statements that were consistent with statements offered by other forms of agency guidance, such as, such as publications or even statements by high level agency officials. But there was little recognition of the fact that nonetheless, these statements may not be appropriate uh, for a particular user in a particular context. And also, I thought really interestingly, agency officials tended to express the view that the guidance being offered by automated legal guidance was not law, but rather was merely information about the law and, and therefore wasn't subject to various uh, legal rules and requirements that we might ask of law itself. Uh, so sort of based on all of these findings, our, our high level conclusions were that the extreme conciseness and ease of use of automated legal guidance did in fact tend to make automated legal guidance more usable and likely to be used, but it also threatens to worsen some of the problems that complexity creates in terms of democratic and equitable values. In particular, we have concerns about the creation of a two-tier legal system. And I saw a question in the chat that already sort of draws on this. Um, sort of generally speaking, our concern is that users who lack access to sophisticated legal guidance uh, may tend to follow automated legal guidance that tells them they cannot claim benefits to which they're legally entitled, such as certain tax deductions or credits, or they may rely on interpretations of the law that are actually more favorable to users, but that don't bind the government in the event of a legal challenge. Failure to appreciate some of these dynamics by the agency officials involved in the creation of automated legal guidance uh, only tends to increase these problems. At present then, our general conclusion is that even though agency attempts to explain the law to the public inexpensively on a mass scale through automated legal guidance are indeed laudable. There's also a failure to appreciate some of what is lost in the process and trade-offs. Based on our study, we offered several detailed policy recommendations. Our recommendations are designed to encourage agencies to design and deploy automated legal guidance in ways that promote fairness, accuracy, clarity, efficiency, accessibility, and transparency. Just to give you a quick summary of the recommendations we made in each area, in terms of transparency, we recommended that agencies should notify users when formal law is contrary to the automated legal guidance or when it's unsettled. Agencies should create publicly accessible archives that show and include explanation of changes to statements made by chatbots or other automated tools. And agencies should use effective dates on statements made by chatbots and other automated tools, something that we see in other forms of agency guidance, but that we tend to not to see in automated legal guidance. In terms of reliance, when agencies make uh, unilateral statements, and by that we mean statements that are made by the agency without prompting or not in response to queries by users, 
We believe that agencies should allow users to reasonably rely on such statements to bind the agency. With respect to both unilateral and bilateral guidance, with bilateral guidance being the agency's response to a specific query by a user, we believe that agencies should allow users to reasonably rely on statements made by the automated legal guidance to defend against penalties for noncompliance. And uh, going along with these recommendations, agencies should allow users to download a written record of correspondence. And we've actually already seen um, a change in practice in this regard uh, by the interactive tax system. With respect to disclaimers, uh, agencies should include disclaimers regarding limits on users' abilities to bind agencies. Agencies should include disclaimers regarding limits on users' ability to defend against penalties for noncompliance based on the use of the guidance. And where automated legal guidance uses natural language processing, agencies should provide disclaimers that the speaker is not human. With respect to process, agencies should adopt a clear chain of command regarding design, maintenance, and review of automated legal guidance and publish information regarding this process. It was often difficult as part of our study to determine who was doing what and agency officials themselves seemed unsure of who played what role at times in the process of creating the guidance. Agencies should solicit independent expert evaluation of user experience regarding chatbots and other automated legal guidance tools. And in line with uh, some of Nina's questions from before, uh, the federal government should evaluate the costs and benefits of using outside vendors. In terms of accessibility, inclusion, and equity, uh, we think a, a category that has received little attention thus far by agencies uh, that are using automated legal guidance uh, we believe that agencies should study personal characteristics of users of chatbots and other automated tools. If automated tools cannot answer users' questions, and uh, agencies should provide options for uh, obtaining cust human customer service representatives, and agencies should supplement automated legal guidance with other ways to provide increased access to the underlying law. In June 2022, so pretty much a year ago, at its plenary session, ACUS adopted 20 recommendations based on our report uh, to guide federal agency use of automated legal guidance, printed the recommendations in the Federal Register, and distributed them to all federal agencies. Uh, just before I stop speaking, I just want to take a few minutes to mention how some of these findings in this work ties in with broader themes that we think come out of it. First, we think our work is an important intervention into the question of how to design legal rules. Uh, there's certainly a large scholarship regarding how to design legal rules. Some of you may be familiar with robust discussion and debate, for instance, of rules versus standards. But the question of how we actually communicate the law is usually an afterthought, if anything, in this discussion. We think that our work shows that we need to actually optimize on both dimensions at the same time. It's sure, it's important what the formal rules are. Are we gonna have rules or standards? What's gonna be the content of those? But just as important we think is considering, well, how is the government going to communicate these rules once it makes them? And we need to think about the combination of what the rule is and how the government's going to communicate it. There are different possibilities which present different trade-offs. For instance, at one end of the spectrum, we might imagine having just a very simple legal system. It's very simple to explain to the public, and this wouldn't require deviations and explanations to the same extent as we have now. The problem is that a simple legal system won't be able to target benefits and costs of governance as accurately to the right groups, and this can create its own equitable problems. In the middle, we can imagine a system that looks a lot like what we have now, which is a very complex legal system that the government explains to the public through the use of complexity and increasingly through the use of automated legal guidance. A complex legal system allows the government to better target costs and benefits of governance to the right groups, but it requires deviations of the kind that we've identified in our work, which may be exacerbated by automation. Now, at the other end of the legal spectrum, we can increasingly imagine a world in which we have a complex legal system that government doesn't try to explain at all. Rather, it just uses sophisticated AI to impose legal outcomes on people, sort of telling people you were negligent or this is the tax liability that you owe uh, without much explanation or translation. In theory, this could be a superior form of targeting to the right costs and benefits to the right people, and it also avoids some of the 
problems that we've identified with deviations and explanations. But as some of you are anticipating, it also presents some serious transparency and accountability problems in governance. Now, our, our goal isn't to convince you that any one of these is always superior to the other, but rather to suggest that there are different values at stake and that our work regarding automated legal guidance helps us understand some of the values at stake in having a complex legal system that we explain to the public in simple terms increasingly through automation. Uh, understanding the different trade-offs helps us think through which approach might be right in what circumstances. Second, I'll just say really briefly, because I know we've been talking for a while, we do think that our work might help us think through a broader theory regarding how administrative law values apply to the mass public. Throughout our work, we've noted that many aspects of administrative law focus on sophisticated parties. For instance, we've heard already in the uh, discussion today questions of what rules are subject to notice and comment, how notice and comment works. And these are important issues that tend to uh, matter for sophisticated parties who have the ability to access these rules and these procedures. But there's been less attention in the literature to situations where administrative agencies are just interacting with the mass public, such as by simply explaining the law to them. One takeaway from our work that we think needs more development is to consider in these contexts how to take administrative law values of legitimacy, transparency, consistency, and accountability, and infuse them into agency interactions with the mass public. And we do have a forthcoming article, Democratizing Administrative Law, uh, in Duke Law Journal that gets into some of these issues in greater depth. But with that, I will certainly stop and turn it back over to Nina. Thank you. Well, thank you for ending that with that point about democratizing administrative law. I think, you know, there are two things in some of the comments that we've got in the chat. You know, the IRS has a chat bot for installment agreements. And um, people's personal finances are very complex, that as, as anyone on this call who has represented taxpayers can attest. Um, and the chat bot is very simplistic and I think often gets to the wrong answer. And one thing that I'm wanting to monitor is the... Um, uh, the default rate on installment agreements that are entered into with the use of the chatbot compared to other installment agreements at the IRS. The main problem is that there's such a high default rate anyway in the way that the IRS puts people into installment agreements that you may not see the deviation that you think it's just in a continuation of a really bad arrangement anyway. The other example is the um, the tax law assister and the tool that actually IRS employees use in determining the eligibility of a taxpayer for the earned income credit, the child tax credit, et cetera. I can think of no more complex issue factually than, you know, what is a household and, you know, who is the eligible parent or taxpayer for a qualifying child in order to receive these sizable benefits. And they are directed to a population that is definitely not sophisticated. And as you see those tools, and this goes to one of the comments in the chat, those tools were not developed with any input from the Taxpayer Advocate Service, for example. They were not developed with any input from um, you know, low-income taxpayer clinics who represent these taxpayers daily. What they, why they were developed by the enforcement arm of the IRS that audits taxpayers with some legal guidance. And one of the recommendations from ACUS was both as you're reviewing and you're developing and reviewing these tools, that you have a broad group of people weighing in, which goes to the comment that someone put about, you know, really having systems working equitably that will only happen if you prioritize diversing the data and development teams that make the technology possible. And I've mentioned this in other points, but um, you know, the IRS's instructions to staff, which are to human beings and written out, you know, that are thousands of pages long, are actually reviewed by 
lots of diverse groups inside the IRS, including the Taxpayer Advocate Service for violations of taxpayer rights, et cetera. But none of that happens with these automated tools. And I think that's a, a, an oversight and vigilance and guidance um, principle that needs to be incorporated throughout. Don't know whether you, Josh or Lee or Carrie or, or want to comment on that before I turn it over to Toon, who's been very quiet and I'm sure has lots to say listening to all this. Sure, I won't take up too much time. I'll just say there was a, a lot of uh, wonderful observations in there, I think, which are, are consistent with some of the trends that we saw where um, you have uh, people who are uh, uh, program developers um, really working with the rules without sort of a sufficiently wide base of people involved uh, in ways that are not always transparent and that can have uh, negative impacts on taxpayers who at times are the most vulnerable. And so I won't say much more just so as not to take up more time, but I think those are some great examples. And if anything, we do see the IRS uh, continuing to try to develop and expand the reach of these tools, making some of these issues only more important going forward. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, and this also responds to a comment in the, uh, in the chat about how much this really impacts the, uh, the low income or the less sophisticated taxpayers. Uh, these tools are designed for the mass public. That is the whole reason these agencies are using them. The IRS uh, in its interactive tax assistant currently asks questions, uh, has categories where you can ask about deducting things like medical and dental expenses, but it also has categories where you can ask, is the scholarship that my child received taxable? Is the gift I received taxable? Uh, I, uh, do, do I have to... Um, uh, pay self-employment tax for my income, uh, my gambling winnings, do I have to report? How much do I report? I just received life insurance proceeds. Is that taxable? Uh, and on and on and on, and, and many questions about uh, things related to the earned income tax credit and other, uh, other credits uh, uh, that are really designed, again, for the low income taxpayer. And this makes sense that agencies would use this tool as a way to try to communicate with People don't have access to lawyers and accountants. At the same time, as the few examples we've shown illustrate, they raise a lot of concerns. People who can go to lawyers and accountants can rely on that advice. They might even have a written opinion they can rely on. People who only have access to this tool, this online tool, we know as a legal matter are not able to rely on the answers they receive uh, to uh, bind the agency or in some cases defend against penalties, like certain tax penalties. And so I think, I think the answer to the general question about how much does this really raise issues for the, 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 the least sophisticated taxpayers, those are the taxpayers that we think raise the greatest concerns. And it's the whole reason these tools have been developed. Uh, and the IRS tool is really just the beginning. I'm sure that we'll continue to have more questions added. But whether it's the IRS or an agency like USCIS, possibly giving advice that causes somebody to eventually not become a US citizen, the, the, the consequences are, are greatest for the taxpayers who are, uh, and, and, and general public, uh, who are using these tools as their primary access to the law. Okay, well, Toon, why don't you take it away? <laughs> you can comment on anything that's gone before, but also really talk about the work that you're doing. And a little bit about DigiTax. Too. All right. Thanks, uh, Nina. Um, yeah, so I'm Tom Calder. I work at the Digitex Research Center uh, of the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And um, we are looking at uh, developing techniques uh, for the digitalization of tax and also problems uh, with fairness and bias. So, uh, and uh, all right. Um, and some of the things. Uh, I want to talk about it is uh, about um, or, or one of the things we're looking at is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, how do machines learn and how can we make it fair? And one of the points I would like to make is, um, well, the necessity for uh, fairness and bias detection and also that this is not per se uh, a very easy uh, problem. 
Um, so typically, uh, many types of, of uh, models exist, uh, like decision trees, rule-based systems, but also neural networks. And that's kind of important because these type of models, they are very hard to inspect. Um, so when we're talking about fairness of models, we cannot just um, inspect the model and see if it's not using any uh, forbidden attributes, because sometimes it's making decisions in a very uh, convoluted way, and it's very hard to interpret them. And uh, an example, we can train models to learn uh, tax fraud from historical data. Now we typically feed it with a lot of um, tax applications. These are Belgian ones, uh, but I'm pretty sure that it works similarly in other countries. Uh, some are labeled as uh, historically uh, detected fraud and some are labeled as not fraud. From this, we can learn some rules. We turn it into a table, we can learn some rules and then we can make uh, predictions. And now what we want to have is that those systems and that they are um, not biased towards certain communities, that they are accurate, uh, uh, obviously, and, and that they can scale, uh, work with, a, uh, or, and typically they scale and work at a much larger speed and efficiency than uh, humans can, uh, can do. So there is uh, a big promise of artificial intelligence, and that's also why everyone is pursuing it now, nowadays. Um, and also, and because it's based on historical data, yeah, we, we might think it's free from bias. Uh, however, it might uh, pick up patterns that are hidden in the data, uh, in the historical data uh, unintentionally and amplify bias from observations leading to uh, unintended effects. This can be particularly problematic for those models like neural networks uh, where the, the explanations cannot always be uh, explained. And, and, and here is an example of a bias picked up by a system. And that was a system for automatic um, inventory management and uh, setting the prices where in a supermarket, I think it was a Walmart, um, the, there was a price differentiation between black and white Barbies, probably because of the Walmart being situated in a predominantly white neighborhood. And uh, in this way, uh, one type was more popular than uh, the other, um, which is, an unintended effect of the system being used. It's not being programmed to be uh, uh, racist or to imply that uh, one is better than the other and more expensive. And but it is, this is an unwanted effect of uh, automating the process and not having a human uh, in the loop. Uh, another example of where uh, things failed at scale is the Siri case in the Netherlands, which is a very well known case for fraud detection where different agencies in the Netherlands were sending uh, data um, to a central administration that was then building a risk model. Uh, for instance, there were municipalities involved, immigration authorities, the tax office, uh, employment uh, law supervision, um, and then a model would be built and people that would be flagged as being potentially fraudulent and they were that was communicated again back to the different um, agencies uh, that would then in depth check uh, those people and withhold benefits. And very often it was, if you were considered to be suspicious, um, benefits would be withhold, withheld until you were cleared by a check and having a, a serious impact on people's life. Um, and the Dutch state was even convicted uh, for using this system because it was considered a violation of the, the European uh, Human Rights Treaty, um, where um, the reason was basically the proportionality. I think that's an important aspect why we need maybe more strict rules even for algorithms than um, for, for uh, purely uh, human-based systems, because the way of proportionality, because in the Netherlands, uh, if this system, if this would, this similar system would have been enforced by uh, using people that go door to door and check on people, um, that would have been much more visible and problems with the system would have became, become much more visible than now where it happens uh, automatically and with a lack of, uh, of transparency. Uh, apart from that, it turned out that there were also potential biases in the system being used in certain neighborhoods with minorities um, were disproportionately uh, targeted. Uh, another interesting study um, by the uh, recent study by the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research um, was looking at uh, IRS um, 
tax audit um, data. And they basically found out that uh, black community was audited at much higher rates than the general population. And that was even the case when corrected for factors like uh, earned income tax credit, a specific type of credit that usually people with lower income uh, benefit from, uh, income in general, family situations, and so on. It's a very uh, broad study they did. And they found out even if you correct for those factors and the black community was all the much uh, higher rate. Uh, and what is also very interesting in this study, and that brings me to uh, one of the points that I want to make, that uh, uh, is the potential causes uh, of that. And um, one potential cause could be the uh, objective of the predictive model that is used. So basically they showed and they did some simulations where they looked at um, what is the objective function of my predictive model. Um, for instance, am I, do I want to optimize the number of fraud cases that I detect? Um, or do I want to retrieve uh, or recuperate as many dollars as possible? And so uh, do I emphasize on those cases that have a higher amount uh, of fraud, a higher discrep uh, discrepancy, or the total number of cases. Um, uh, operational considerations can also play a role there, where the high-end cases um, are probably more complex and require um, more um, qualified personnel, and, and that there are some constraints there. Um, and this is one of the uh, graphs from their paper. Uh, where basically they look at the system and they they train a system to make these predictions and what if they would implement uh, that system and what would be the outcome where you see at the vertical axis you see the disparity and so that's you can translate it as a level of discrimination it's the difference in audit rates between um, the two com uh, communities in uh, percentage points and so this is uh, 0 0.1 0 0.2 0. Point um, three uh, percent, but uh, if you look at the basic audit rate being zero point fifty four percent, this uh, is, is is already quite significant. Uh, and they look at uh, what if we would have perfect knowledge and we just start checking from the case that gives us the most money to uh, the cases that that uh, the fraudulent cases that give us the least money. It's an unrealistic model, but it's a good baseline. And there you see, and that there is not that much disparity, or if there is disparity, it's in the opposite direction than what they actually are observing in uh, the IRS data that they obtained. And uh, if you would, and because this is an ideal situation, if you would train a model to predict that, and then you get this uh, uh, graph here, and why does it uh, stop much earlier? And that is because we're less effective. So with the same amount of effort, we will retrieve less money with the regressor. And then uh, basically you see here, another objective is if instead of looking at optimizing the number of cases, or uh, sorry, in, instead of concentrating on the amount of money to retrieve, we want to optimize the number of fraud cases we detect. Then you see the things happening that they found in the IRS data as well and that there actually is discrimination uh, where the black population is disadvantaged. Uh, or if you concentrate on what type of fraud I want to detect, uh, you can uh, look at underreporting your income on the one hand or um, applying for a refund that you're not uh, eligible to. If you concentrate on the second type and then you see this graph uh, here. And by this, I mean, and because I always already saw some comments like, yeah, I need to make sure that the data um, is unbiased uh, and clean data is the key, uh, or that there is a diverse team uh, working on the problem. Here you see and the same team working with the same data would acquire vastly different outcomes based on which objective that they choose, which type of fraud we're going to concentrate on, or which constraints may I have in my uh, organization. Um, so at Digitax, we look at uh, fair responsible uh, AI. Um, how can we measure and mitigate uh, bias? And also about measuring uh, bias. I also think there it's important to note that this is not an easy question. Uh, when is something fair? 
Um, and I will illustrate that with an example, uh, which is the compass uh, case, um, but it, it could also apply to, to any other case. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, the compass uh, was a tool to predict risk of recidivism. And the label that they use to train the data is there a new arrest within two years. Data that uh, they were using is pending charges, prior arrest history, uh, uh, pre-trial failure, uh, also um, the family situation, um, things like that in order to make prediction if someone would um, commit a crime again or not. Um, what a study found out, it's already from some years ago, is that um, the model was disadvantaging uh, African-Americans. And here you see uh, basically the, uh, some differences in statistics. So there, there's, every system makes errors, and, but we want the errors to be equally distributed. And here you see that the system made very big difference. Uh, the errors that it was making were very different. For instance, uh, who is labeled higher risk, but uh, doesn't reoffend? There it turned out that this type of error, if you look at all the people that didn't reoffend, for 44.9% of the African Americans, they were predicted to be high risk, while for whites, this error was made at a much lower rate. Uh, and if labeled lower risk, but did not, uh, but did reoffend, the other uh, error um, was much more prevalent for white people than African uh, American people. So here, uh, you would conclude this system is not, uh, is not fair. So basically, we have the whole population, and, and this also works with uh, tax fraud detection. Uh, we, we have here two communities. Some of them are marked as being potentially fraudulent or uh, potential recidivists. Some of them are uh, labeled as being cleared, um, uh, not recidivists, or no um, tax fraud. Uh, then we observe what happens. So that is basically how we can test fairness in the system. When we run a simulation on, uh, uh, on some data, we see what would our algorithm predict and what is the true outcome. And for instance, in the case of the IRS, there is the National Research Program where they take a stratified random sample, which they check and they are not selected by an algorithm, but randomly selected. And so these are, we have a prediction and then uh, uh, whether fraud is detected or not. And then there are different ways to look at it. In the ProPublica analysis, they look at, um, um, okay, and what is the category? Someone who is a recidivist, and for how many of those do we predict that they were not recidivists? And so here are two errors uh, uh, among the uh, black persons and more and for the white people. Here are the percentages, so one over five, one over three. So these are the so-called false uh, negatives. And here are the false positives. And so those who did not recommit a crime, but were marked as being high risk. And so here they say, okay, if we look at the two communities, then we see differences in errors. And so the system is unfair. However, you can also look at it from a different perspective. And that is what Northpoint did. It's the same uh, numbers, but now we divide the groups differently. Now we look at um, all those that were marked by the algorithm as being high risk. And then we see that in both cases, four out of five recommitted a crime for those in this category. And if you look at those that were marked as low risk, and if one third, which is marked as being uh, recommitting a crime, so there are errors being made, one fifth here, uh, two thirds here, but there are no differences between the two communities. Same data, and but we just divide the groups differently and uh, it looks like now everything is fair. So where does it come from? And that I'm taking a lot of time, so I will be uh, a bit more quick uh, about this. Um, that is because um, we have a low risk group and a high risk group. Um, in both groups, errors are being made, uh, but all the people that got the low risk um, label and recommitted the crime, all of those, are in this group, and all of the people who get the wrong label, they got the high risk label that they did not recommit a crime, are in this group here, and so the high risk group. We have black and white, black and white, um, and, and the, the proportion is the same. So that is the second analysis that we made. 
we divide them into the low risk, the people that got the low risk label, the people that got the high risk label, and then uh, we see that both groups are equally represented uh, in both, or the errors uh, are the same. Uh, but then is uh, uh, all the errors where you get a more beneficial label than you deserve are made in this group, and all the mistakes where you get a less desirable label than you deserve are made in this group here. And then, of course, uh, here in the ProPublica study, the proportion of uh, the both communities were different in the two groups. And so the uh, one community was overrepresented in the group, in the high-risk group, where more people got the negative label and the other one in the low-risk group. And so is it fair? Is it unfair? It's, it's extremely hard to say in this case. And it's really an ethical question. So you cannot just say we, we put in the law, it needs to be fair. If you learn an algorithm, it needs to treat people fairly. Uh, then you need to decide uh, which of the two ways of fair do you mean? Can we be fair in both ways? No, it has been shown mathematically uh, that it is impossible unless uh, you have perfect predictability. So we know on before and who is going to recommit a crime and who uh, isn't, which is of course unrealistic. Uh, or if there is no difference in the two communities, then uh, obviously that's also, uh, then it's possible, and, but that's again, not uh, realistic. Um, so uh, what kind of techniques do we propose then to deal with um, uh, fairness and unfairness? I think one important aspect are explanations. And we need to understand why algorithms are making certain decisions. This is a slide that I took from a colleague where he explains explanations by a user that watched a number of movies. And based on his selection, he is being predicted as male. Um, then uh, there are uh, techniques like Lime um, who give the most important aspects that uh, gave you the decision or uh, counterfactuals or another uh, quite popular technique nowadays that's being studied. Uh, where basically in counterfactuals, I think this is, this is a quite interesting proposal, uh, where basically um, we are saying that um, what should change in the profile of Sam in order to predict that Sam is not a male but female, that would give an indication of which of the factors were important. The same, I get an audit by the IRS, then the IRS could basically give an explanation, it could be an option. It's, it's worth uh, considering that by looking at the counterfactual and telling me what should change uh, uh, if this and this and this would have been different in your tax application, in your tax file, then you would not have been selected uh, for an audit. I think it's, it's an interesting uh, proposal or an interesting way of giving feedback um, because on the one hand, it can be actionable. It can give me some information on how to improve uh, myself. And on the other hand, you can also give an explanation without uh, giving away the whole model. And that was also one of the comments that was that was given. Like, okay, the, uh, the IRS, of course, does not want to share the rules they're using to select people for the audit and maybe such partial information, local information uh, could uh, help. Voila. Let me skip over this. Um, yeah, then uh, what should we do? Um, fairness by design is one of the things that in the EU is being uh, um, pushed a lot, um, where we try to make um, uh, model building in such a way and that uh, a number of things need to be taken into account. And so this is, for instance, from the ethics guideline for trustworthy AI, where I think are a couple of important uh, aspects of the transparency you see coming back here. Um, for instance, uh, we have these two ways of looking at the compass system. Um, which of the two ways do we choose? And we need to be transparent about that. Uh, if our system has a disparate impact on different uh, communities, uh, data privacy, of course, human oversight, and that there should be a human in the loop that has meaningful control over the uh, process. Uh, accountability, who is responsible for the decisions, and is there a way, uh, like like um, recourse, can we basically 
uh, if a wrong decision is taken, can we can we can we fight the decision? Technical robustness and safety, and this has to do, for instance, with the bias and uh, fairness mitigation techniques that uh, we could use. Voila. So uh, conclusion: uh, fairness should explicitly be taken into account. I think removing sensitive data alone is not enough, and the IRS is not using data about race and that's still the impact was different on uh, uh, communities. Uh, need for fairness by design, uh, detecting bias in data and models, detect how different communities are affected and explain explainable techniques can help. Voila. Tune, I think that's so helpful. And I think your discussion of the IRS Stanford study, we had Dan Ho on earlier this week, talked a little bit about this, but what I thought was so important about that study was what your point is that it looked at how the objective of designing your risk selection model, your audit selection model was important and changed the, the results in terms of the impact of that model. And then also the, the discussion about operational considerations. And given that the earned income credit is such a you know a focus of um, congressional attention, and the IRS has felt absolutely um, required to do a very high level of earned income credit audits, uh, and yet the study really showed that earned income credit audits, if you use that as one of your selection criteria, increases racial bias. Um, and I just thought that 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 review was just so important. And I think what's disturbing is that that's not part of an agency's routine oversight and checking, you know, that, that, and I think that's where you get to your EU principles that you have to have, and that ACUS actually recommended this continuous loop in a way of oversight and testing to ensure that the system is working in the way that you want it to over time at the beginning, but also over time. So I wanna open this up in case anyone wants to say any closing statements. Um, we've had a great discussion um, and I don't know, I think that this has been really informative and educative for us as we go forward thinking about how how AI works, especially within the tax system, but in general. So Carrie, Josh, Lee, you want to close with any comments or thoughts? I just want to mention one thing that I, I, I think adds on to the to uh, all of these discussions, certainly. Uh, it fits, I think, with Josh and Lee's study as well, um, is the introduction of the new um, large language models and uh, chat GPT and what that will mean for information that the public gets about tax obligations. Uh, it's not anymore, I think, likely to be just um, government uh, uh, chat bots and, and, and uh, uh, re response systems, but we're going to see a proliferation of of tools that may or may not have been designed specifically to address tax systems, but which the public uh, may draw upon. There was an interesting case in the news recently about a lawyer who relied on ChatGPT uh, in drafting a, 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 some kind of a brief or motion, and uh, it generated, it hallucinated and generated some, some cases that did not exist. Uh, and we have to worry about the public, I think, uh, being disinformed uh, by some of these uh, these tools, especially about tax obligations and, and other other obligations as well going forward. Yeah, and I think I'll just just add that uh, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, we're moving in the direction that Carrie just described. Uh, it's it's not like we're going to. Uh, for government only or any particular agency slam on the brakes and say, we're no longer going to go down this road. We're gonna go back to uh, human beings who can answer questions or in-person service centers or even printed publications. Every time we interact with an airline or the bank or uh, uh, you know, any, any service, we're now 
you know, using these tools in the government, uh, especially with the um, increase of some of the, uh, uh, the large language tools like Carrie suggested, uh, uh, the government's not gonna be able to resist this. So rather than try to uh, think about what the world would be like, we could go backwards thinking about how we can introduce transparency, accountability, and, um, and, and, and fairness is uh, what we should do, especially as lawyers. And that's, that, that's what you know, I think for Lee and me, that's really what our, our main goal is, not to argue that this is a good thing or a bad thing, this is happening. So we should think about the legal structure in which it exists. Yeah, and I'll just emphasize, I think, a connection between the different talks here today. Uh, I thought Toon did a really great job discussing uh, how, ways that we have identified discrimination and bias in the context of the use of AI and enforcement decisions. And that Stanford study was hugely important in uh, identifying uh, significant forms of bias that we uh, hadn't previously been able to identify. Uh, I think that there is reason to believe there's likely to be uh, bias also in the context of guidance giving through the use of automation. And uh, we really haven't sort of scratched the surface on that yet. And one of the um, findings that we had in our project uh, with ACUS was that the government really isn't keeping any sort of statistics or attempting to identify which type of users, um, what the demographic of users are who are getting different types of guidance. And so especially as this uh, use of guidance continues to expand, as Josh said, and uh, sometimes with uh, uh, information that uh, has a tenuous relation to reality, as Kerry said, uh, it's important to keep in mind ways that different groups of people might be affected differently by um, th this type of guidance. So Toon, do you want to have the last word? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be talking also about a large language model because there is a lot of, of uh, hype and also a lot of uh, uh, new applications that we see nowadays and uh, there are good things and bad things. I think one uh, very good uh, aspect is that I think it can make uh, a lot of information more accessible to more people because the, the interface is uh, more, more human-like. Uh, things we are concerned about, of course, is hallucinations, um, and then who will be responsible if wrong advice is given. Um, also, in, in Europe, we are very concerned in that a few big players are basically having uh, all the large language models and the capacity to build them, uh, and that we are, we are lagging behind. Um, and I think it's also very important that for those systems, that a lot of transparency is given about what data was used to train it on, what kind of measures have been taken in order to guarantee um, fairness and uh, yeah, that, that stereotypes, for instance, do not seep in the, the uh, advisors that, uh, that are be, be given. But yeah, uh, very interesting times, I think. So just as a plug, next June, from June 4th through 6th, the Center for Taxpayer Rights and the University of Antwerp will be holding the ninth International Conference on Taxpayer Rights. And the theme will be working toward a digital taxpayer bill of rights. So um, just stay tuned. We'll make sure everyone on this call gets notice when we open the registration, but this will just be a little foreshadowing of what we're doing there. And who knows what will have happened in the year intervening, a lot, I'm sure. So thank you all. Thank you to the guests. You've done an incredible job, educated us a lot. There's a lot to think about. We will post PowerPoints, et cetera, um, on the webpage that we're developing for the materials for these um, programs, as well as videos, so that you can go back and see some of the things that people have said. So we'll let you know when we have our next one. Um, it'll be coming up probably in two weeks and we're looking at IRS notices and the whole process of developing notices, which goes into language. Um, and then we're going to start working or looking at collection um, and the IRS's collection practices, including the use of automation in collection. So thank you all. This was a great session. I really appreciate it. Bye.